It's Thursday, first graders. You know what that means. We got a Zoom meeting tonight. I hope to see you then at 7 o'clock. Uh, getting back into this book, Boxcar Children, we are on chapter 8. Chapter 8, A Swimming Pool at Last. Picture. The boxcar children were so tired that they slept until 10 o'clock Sunday morning. When they woke up at last, they hurried through breakfast and went to work on the swimming pool. We'll make a dam across the brook, said Henry. Here's my cart, said Benny. I'll cut the cart stones and logs in it. Good for you, laughed Henry. The four children went down to the brook to look at the pool Jesse had seen. The water was quiet here, and there was a clean sand there was clean sand all around the little pool. It's big enough for a swimming pool, Henry remarked, but I don't think it's deep enough. He put a long stick in to see how deep it was. Then he looked at the wet stick, and he found the water was about a foot deep. A swimming pool should be three times as deep, he said. Then it will be deep enough to swim in, and it won't be too deep for Benny. We'll build the dam here with logs and stones. While the other children started the dam, Jesse washed all their stockings. We won't want our stockings on while we're working in the brook, she remarked, and rinsed them and hung them in the clothesline to dry. So this is a good time to wash them. It was hard work building the dam, but the children liked hard work. Henry and Jesse pulled the logs to the brook, and Violet and Benny carried the stones with the help of the cart. Now and then, Henry was called on to help with a heavy stone, but the two younger children carried most of them. Splash the stones right into the water, Henry told them. Be careful to keep them in a line between these two trees. The children watched with delighted eyes as the wall of stones under the water began to grow higher and higher. <clears throat> the rock wall will help to hold the logs in place, said Henry. At last, it was time to lay the logs across the brook. Let's lay the first ones between these two trees, said Jesse. Then the trees will hold both ends of the logs. Good work, cried Henry, much pleased. That's just what we'll do, but... When the first big log was splashed into place on top of the stone wall, the water began to water over the top, began to run over the top of the log and around both ends. Oh dear, cried Jesse. The water runs around the ends every time. What should we do? We'll have to put logs, lots of logs on with brush between them, said Henry. We'll put on so many that the water can't get through. They laid three logs across with three more on top of them and three more on top of those. Violet filled her arms with brush and held it in place until each log was laid. Benny filled the holes at both ends of the logs with flat stones. Such wet children never were seen before. But the hot sun would dry them off, and no one cared. When the three top logs were laid in place at last, the four tired children... Excuse me. ...sat down to watch the pool fill. But Henry could not sit still as the water came higher and higher up the dam. See how deep the pool is getting? He cried. See, see how still it is? At last the pool was full. And the water came over the top of the dam and made another waterfall. Just like a mill dam, said Henry. Now the pool is deep enough for all of us to swim in. You boys can have the first swim, said Jesse. We girls must go off and get dinner. We'll ring the bell when we are ready. The boys splashed around in the pool while the girls made a fire and hung the kettle of brown stew over it, stirring it now and then. Violet cut the bread and got the butter, hard and cold, out of the refrigerator. When everything was ready, Jesse rang the dinner bell. This bell was only a tin can from the dump. Jesse had hung it on a tree with a string, and she rang it with a spoon. Then she got the ladle and began ladling out the stew. That's the dinner bell, said Benny. I know what it is. Come, watch. Don't you want some dinner? Watch had a swim, too. He came out of the water and shook himself. The two boys put on their dry clothes. First graders, I'm sorry. I keep yawning today. Put on their dry clothes and went to Sunday dinner. Let me ring the bell again, said Benny. I like stew even better today, said Henry, eating hungrily. That's because we work so hard, remarked Jesse. Let's go for a walk in the woods this afternoon. Oh, let's, cried Violet. Let's go exploring again. The children washed the dishes and then started on their walk. As they went along, 
Watch began to bark. At first, the explorers were frightened. Oh, what is it? cried Violet. Maybe it's a rabbit, said Henry. Then they saw a hen running away through the woods. Watch ran after her, but Henry called them back. Don't run after the poor hen, he said. The hen had a nest, remarked Benny. What? asked Jessie. She had some eggs in it, said Benny. Come here and see. Jessie looked on the ground where Benny was pointing and saw the nest with five eggs in it. A runaway hen, said Jessie. She wanted to hide her nest so she would have some chickens. We'll have the eggs for supper. I know how to cook eggs. The eggs made a delicious supper. Jessie put them in a bowl with a little salt and Violet took a spoon and stirred them as hard as she could. Put in some milk, Violet, said Jessie, and stir them some more. Henry started up the fire. The big kettle was hung over the fire and Jessie put in some butter. She watched the butter until it was nice and brown and she put them, she put in the eggs. Here's a picture of that. Sit down, she said. Be all ready to eat when the eggs are done. Violet put the blue tablecloth on the ground. She got the bread and butter and the plates and spoons, and the children all sat ready for supper. Here I come, cried Jessie. Hold out your plates. Oh, Jessie, cried Benny. This is the best meal I ever ate. I found the eggs, and you cooked them. Yes, you did, said Benny. Yes, excuse me. Yes, you did, Benny, said Henry. Thank you for a fine meal. Tomorrow we'll have to eat bread and milk, said Jessie. But when tomorrow came, the children had more than bread and milk, as you will soon see. <clears throat> Chapter 9. Fun in the Cherry Orchard. Here's a picture of that. Notice there's a picture for every chapter. The next morning, Henry thought and thought about taking the other children to pick cherries with him. At last, he told his sisters about it as they ate bread and milk for breakfast. Dr. Moore said he wanted more children to help. Do you think all of us ought to go, Jesse? Well, said Jesse, I don't know. You see, there are four of us. If Grandfather's looking for us, it would be easier to see, to see four than one. Yes, that's so, answered Henry. But we could go down the hill and through the streets two by two. I'll take Benny and go ahead. Then in a little while, you and Violet can come with the dog. Good, said Jesse. Watch can tell where you go. The children took down the clothesline and shut the door of the car. Everything was in order. Then they started out. When they arrived at the orchard, they soon saw that they were not the only workers. The doctor was there and the cook and two men carrying ladders and baskets. Good morning, Henry, said Mrs. Moore. Can you work today? Oh, yes, said Henry. These are my sisters, Jessie and Violet. They can pick cherries, too. Betty is too young to climb trees, but we had to bring him. Maybe he can carry baskets, said Dr. Moore, smiling at Benny. You see, this is a big cherry year, and we have to work fast once we begin. <clears throat> That's true. Maybe he can help fill the little baskets from the big ones. Eat all you want, said Mrs. Moore. The cherries are beautiful this year. The children didn't eat all they wanted, but every now and then a big red cherry went into someone's mouth. Henry and the girls went up the ladders and began to pick cherries. Watch barked for a while. He did not like to have Jessie climbing the ladder. Then he sat down and looked up at her in the tree. Benny hurried here and there, carrying baskets to the pickers and eating all the cherries he wanted. Everyone in the orchard liked Benny. The doctor laughed delightfully at him, and sweet Mrs. Moore fell in love with him at once. By and by, he sat down beside her and carefully filled small baskets with cherries from big baskets. The men laughed at the funny things Benny said, and Watch barked happily. By and by, the doctor left the orchard to make some calls. By and by means like here and there. It's, a, it's almost kind of an older-fashioned saying. At last, Mrs. Moore said, I never had such happy cherry pickers before. You were having such a good time out here that I don't want to go in the house, she smiled. 
Mary the cook seemed to think the same thing, for she came again and again into the orchard. After a while, the cook went in to get dinner, but the children still picked cherries. At noon, Dr. Moore came home. You must stay to dinner, he said to the children. We can eat here in the orchard under the trees. Will your mother be watching for you? When he asked this, he looked at Henry in a weird way. Henry did not know what to say, but at last Jesse said, No, our mother and father are dead. Then you must stay, said Mrs. Moore. Here comes Mary. The cook put a table under the trees, and they all sat around it and ate a delicious dinner. And Mary went into the house and came out again with a big bowl of cherry dumplings. I can smell something good, cried Benny. Is it cherries? Yes, my little dear, said Mary. Cherry dumplings. The cherries are cooked in the dumplings. Benny ate his cherry dumplings and then went to sleep with the dog for a pillow. But Henry and Jesse and Violet began to work again. Mrs. Moore looked out the window at them. Just see how those children work, she said to Dr. Moore. They are so polite, too. I wonder who they are. Dr. Moore said nothing. After a while, he went out to the orchard. You have worked long enough, he said. He gave them four dollars and all the cherries they could carry. That is too much, said Henry. No, said Dr. Moore, it is just right. You see, you are better than most workers because you are so happy. Come again. I'll come every day, said Benny. They all laughed. Dr. Moore saw that the children did not all leave the orchard at the same time, but started down the street two by two. I wish I knew who they are, he said to himself. When the cherry pickers got back to their little home, they looked everything over carefully. But things were just as they had left them. The door was still closed, and the milk and the butter were still in the refrigerator. The children had made a happy supper of bread and butter and cherries, and then went to bed in the boxcar. That same night, Dr. Moore sat reading the paper. All at once, he saw the word lost and began to read. Lost. Four children. Two boys and two girls, somewhere around Greenfield or Silver City. $5,000 to anyone who can find them. Signed, James Henry Alden. $5,000 if you find these kids? Wow. That's a lot of money. Dr. Moore sat up. $5,000, he said. James Henry Alden, oh my, oh my. He sat still for a long time, thinking and laughing to himself. The four children are living in a boxcar, but I shall not tell Mr. Alden that they are his grandchildren, he said. <clears throat> Chapter 10. Oh, it's a long... Whoa! <laughs> oh, maybe I meant... Let me, let me see how long it is. I thought I saw how long it is, but I got. I ended up on chapter 12, so I missed a page. Ooh, it's pretty long. 16 pages long. I think... Boy. I think I might save this one for tomorrow. So I'm having a hard time deciding. I'm looking at the time, I'm like, hmm, that'll take this in. A you know what? I'm just going to go for it. Chapter 10. If this is a long video for you, just pause it and come back to it. Chapter 10, <clears throat> Henry and the Free-for-All. You get a drink of water. I haven't had coffee yet, I know. What is wrong with me? That's what's wrong with me. I need my coffee. Someone bring me coffee. They can't hear me. Chapter 10, Henry and the Free-for-All. James Henry Alden was a very rich man. His big mills stood just between Greenfield and Silver City. So this is their grandpa. Now, J.H. Alden liked boys. He liked to see them running and jumping and playing. So each year, with three other rich men, he gave a field day to the town of Silver City. And even the mills were closed on field day. Every year, the boys in training were in training for the races. And not only boys, but men also. Thin, wide, and girls trained for field day. There were prizes for all kinds of races, running and swimming and jumping. But the best one was a foot race called a free-for-all, because anyone could run in it. 
Mr. Alden gave a prize of $25 and a silver cup to the winner of the free-for-all. Sometimes a boy won the race. Sometimes a girl. On field day, Henry was cutting the grass for Dr. Moore. Suddenly, the doctor stopped his car in the street and called to Henry. Hop in, he said. Today is field day, and I want you to see the races. Henry hopped in, and the doctor started the car. I'm sorry, I can't go, said Dr. Moore, and I want you to know all about it. I want you to tell me who wins each race. Soon, Henry found himself sitting on the bleachers. By and by, a small boy climbed up the bleachers and sat beside him. Then a man called, free for all! Come and get ready! What is that? asked Henry. A free for all? Don't you know? asked the small boy. Didn't you see the one last year? No, said Henry. The boy laughed. That was a funny one, he said. There were two men in it, some girls and boys. The boy over there won it. You should have seen him. He ran so fast, you could hardly see his legs at all. Henry looked at the winner of last year's race. He was smaller than Henry, but he was older. Suddenly, Henry stood up and quietly left the bleachers. He went to the room where the boys were getting ready for the race. Do you want to run in the race? A man asked him. Yes, I do, replied Henry. The man gave him some track clothes to put on. Where did you train? He asked. I was never trained, said Henry. These boys have been training all year, remarked the man. Oh, I don't think I'll win, answered Henry, but I like to run. It's lots of fun, you know. So it is, said the man. So it is. Henry could hardly wait for the race to begin. He loved to run, but at last the race was called. It was time to start. Henry was number four. Now Henry began to think. It's a long race, he said to himself. I gotta go easy at first. The bell rang. Off went the runners down the track. In almost no time, Henry was far behind most of the other runners, but he did not seem to mind this. It's fun to run anyway, he said, grinning into himself, and he tried to see how easily he could run. All at once, he had another thought. I have tried to see how easily I can run, he said to himself. Now I'll try to see how fast I can run. And then all the people began to see how fast Henry could run. He ran faster and faster, and soon he passed the two girls ahead of him. Then he passed the larger man and a little boy. The people began to shout, number four, number four. There was a, here was the kind of race they loved. Faster, faster, cried Henry to himself. I can run faster than this. He could. He passed number 25, number, 20, number six. Then he passed number five, number 10. Only one runner was ahead of Henry now, and that was number 16. Then Henry began to think of winning the race. He knew how much the $25 prize would mean to Jesse and the rest of the children. I'm going to win, win this race, he said to himself. I must pass number 16. He ran faster and faster. He could see the line at the end of the race. Number four, number four, shouted the people. He's going to win. Check out the picture. <clears throat> when Henry was near number 16, he put his head down and ran fast as he could. He passed number 16 and went across the line. He had won. The people shouted and shouted. Some men held Henry high up and carried him to Mr. Alden for the prize. Then a man asked, what is your name, boy? Henry did not know what to say. He did not want to tell his name. So he answered, Henry James. Now this was Henry's name, but it wasn't all of his name. At once, the big sign said, Henry James, number four, winner of free for all. Here's the prize, Henry James, said Mr. Alden. You can run well, my boy. I like to see you run. He gave Henry a silver cup and $25. Then he shook his hands with him. Just then, Dr. Moore came along and climbed into the bleachers, but Henry did not see him. The doctor laughed to himself as Henry James shook hands with James Henry. At last, Henry got away from the people and started back to Dr. Moore's. He had the $25 prize in his pocket. <sighs> that coffee's calling my name. <clears throat> Excuse me. When Dr. Moore came home and found, Doc, found Henry cutting the grass, he laughed quietly to himself. I just got home, said Henry. I will tell you who won all the races. Dr. Moore did not tell Henry that he had been up in the bleachers. He let Henry tell him about the races. And who won the free-for-all, he asked. I did, said Henry. You did, cried Dr. Moore. Good for you. What are you going to do with all the money? I'll give it to Jesse, answered Henry. Good, said the doctor again. When Henry arrived at the boxcar with the $25, he found dinner ready. Jesse had boiled the rest of the vegetables and put butter on top. The children began to eat, but hungry as they were, they stopped when Henry told them about the race 
and showed them the silver cup. They were so excited, they couldn't eat. You won the race, Henry, cried Jesse. I'm so glad. You can run fast, Henry, said Benny. I'm glad you won the race, too, he looked at the silver cup. I said my name was Henry James, said Henry. That's right, said Jesse. So it is. You didn't have to change it? Are we rich now, Henry? asked Benny. No, not very, said Henry, laughing. By the way, I bought something for supper. Jesse looked at the bag. There were some fat brown potatoes in it. Oh, I know how to cook these, cried Jesse happily. They will be good. You just wait. I can't wait, said Henry, laughing. Then he went back to work. After dinner, Benny played around with the dog. Benny, Jesse said suddenly as she hung her dish towels up to dry. It's high time you learn to read. No, said Benny. No school now. Jesse laughed. No, she said. You can't go to school, but I can help you. I wish I had a book. We could make a book, said Violet. We have all the papers left from bundles. So we could, replied Jesse. But what could we use to make the words? We could use a burn stick out of the fire, said Violet. So Jesse put the end of a long stick into the fire and burned it black. Then she used the burned end to make words. Won't Henry be glad when he finds Benny can read, cried Violet. Now Benny did not want to learn to read, but he liked to watch the girls make the book. Jesse made the words see me in the book. She called Benny, but he could not tell C from me. Don't you see, Benny? said Jesse. This one has an S. It says C. This one has an M. It says me. But Benny did not see. It's too hard for me, he said. I'll tell you, Jesse, said Violet at last. Let's make C on one paper and me on the other. That's the way they do it in school. Then have him point to C. The girls did this. They called Benny and Jesse, showed him again very carefully the word that said C. Then she put the two words down on the ground. Now, Benny, point to C, said Jesse. Benny looked at the two words. He could not tell. But Watch barked and put his paw on C. Now Watch did not know one word from the other, but Benny thought he did. Was he going to let a dog get ahead of him? Not Benny. He looked at the words and leaned, learned them, leaned, learned them almost at once. Good old Watch, said Jesse. It isn't hard to tell at all, said Benny. Is it, Watch? Before Suppy, but Suppy. Oh my goodness, I'm having a, my wife actually just brought in coffee. I'm gonna roll over here and get the coffee. I got the coffee. Oh, instantly better. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where did I leave off? <clears throat> then Jesse put wet papers around them and put them in the fire under the hot stones. Are you going to burn them up, Jesse? asked Benny. Oh no, Benny, said Jesse. You wait and see. When Henry came home, he found Jesse rolling the potatoes out of the fire. They were very black. Oh, did you burn them up? asked Henry. No, indeed, said Jesse. Come and see. She gave three black potatoes to each one. They are very hot, said Violet. Look out. Open them, said Jesse, and take out the potato with a spoon, and then put the butter on top with some salt. I will get Benny's out. How well are they? Oh, cried Benny. They are delicious. What did I tell you, said Jesse. Have some milk. Milk and potatoes make a very good supper, said Henry. I can read, remarked Benny. What? said Henry. Yes, he can, said Violet. He learned this afternoon. Go and get your book, Benny. Benny liked to read now. It's not hard, he said. Watch can read, too. Oh, can he, laughed Henry. Let's see him. Watch is too tired now, said Benny. I will read to you. Benny read out of his new book. Good old Benny, said Henry. Come to bed now. You must be tired with all that work. I am tired, too. All right, that is the end of chapter 10. Uh, tomorrow, I will finish this book. Tonight, I hope I see you at the Zoom meeting. You will need a pencil and paper. It doesn't matter if the line paper or if it's blank paper. It's up to you, whatever you got. I'm also going to be reading Fox and Socks. 
I'm gonna read it because I didn't get to it last meeting, so I'm gonna make sure I get to it on this one. If you have this book at home, please read along, okay? You don't have to read like out loud with me, but follow along. Um, yeah, I hope to see you tonight. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you tomorrow and tonight.